Okay, hi everyone. Um, so I always explain the term, what is the difference between search and databases? It's like, I always say this is the database side and this is the search side. The databases are very much about black and white. You want to find something like an exact match or you don't want to find something. It's more for retrieving exact results. Um, yes, you have something like a like search, but that's not very performant and it's also not that feature rich. Whereas search doesn't really care about this exact matches. It cares more about concepts like these shades of gray, um, like maybe I search for something in the singular or in the plural, but I don't really care um, about like the specific form, like if it's go, goes, going, I don't care. I care for the concept to go. Um, that's what search is generally about. So while databases are very much for this black and white approach, like exact matches, search is more about the concept that you might be looking for. So let's dive into that. Um, so I will mostly focus on Elasticsearch because it's by far the most widely used search engine by now. Um, and also I happen to work for Elastic, the company behind um, Elasticsearch. Um, and I mostly travel around and like try to fix problems or explain how stuff works on our side. So let's see. Um, the main difference is when you use search over a database is that you do more work up front. When you actually store or index data, you do more of the work or prepare the data differently, which will give you much more feature richness later on. So when you store something, um, we store something in Elasticsearch today, but the main search features that we're using are all Apache Lucene. So anything that is based on Apache Lucene will use a very similar feature set. Sometimes people are confused and ask, like, what is the database behind Lucene? There is no more database behind Lucene. Lucene is already the thing that writes your data to disk and then reads it back from disk. And basically, Lucene has the search features and writes stuff to disk. What Elasticsearch around it provides then is a REST API, so you can easily interact with that. The query DSL, because it's a bit different than the plain Lucene syntax, and it does distribution and replication of your data. So it kind of like care, takes care of the cluster and how to interact with it. But actually, the storing and search part itself, that is Lucene. And that's all there is. There is no other technology really involved. Yes, it runs on the JVM, but otherwise there is no other database or anything involved in that. Um, if you want to run that, um, we have our own cloud service here, you can run this. For my demo to work, um, you could also use Docker. Um, this is the minimal Docker example that I'm using. So since everything needs to be Docker nowadays, um, all I need is I have a small instance with one gigabyte of memory and Kibana to interact with it more easily. And that's all we use for the search here. So who remembers Star Wars? What was the quote in the movie when he... No Star Wars fans? No, that, that, that's not the force part. Um, yes, exactly. These are not the droids you're looking for. Um, when he plays the mind trick and, well, he gets rid of the, the stormtroopers. Um, and we'll take this example sentence to see how full text search actually works on that or what the analysis in the background does here. So let's say these are not, and I have put an HTML emphasis tag around the not, the droids you're looking for. So, when we want to store that for full text search, we don't store it as is, but we do this analysis to kind of like prepare it to make the search afterwards easier and more performed. So the first thing you normally do is you throw out any formatting because nobody's going to search for that emphasis tag. Um, people just want to search content. Uh, like, let's assume the formatting doesn't make any difference, so we can just strip that out. For example, with HTML, we just strip out the HTML. Then we do the so-called tokenization. Um, so tokenizing, basically, in Western languages, it's pretty simple. Basically, you break up on white spaces and punctuation marks, and you can see the dot at the end is gone, and I've made a bit more space between the words, so each one of these is now a token. Western languages, this is very intuitive and simple. Um, for example, some Asian languages, there it's much more complicated, just tokenizing things properly. But we'll stick to the easy... Western languages for now. Um, so this is the standard tokenizer that we've broken this up on. Um, next, I, watch out, next I lowercase everything. What was the only difference? These. Um, so the, the advantage is here, 
Normally, when I type into Google, I don't care about upper and lower cases. And so that when we search for it, actually, we don't have to make the differentiation anymore. We just lowercase everything. We store everything lowercase. And when people search for it, we also lowercase their search query. And then it just is a direct match. And we don't have to care about any upper or lower casing anymore. Should you always lowercase everything? Maybe not. Sometimes there is a difference. For example, there might be us or US for United States in capital letters that might make a difference. There's not like a general rule, always do this or never do this. It will really, really depend on the data you have and the search queries you want to run. Um, but in many use cases, you probably want to lowercase things. Next up, now we're getting rid of a lot of stuff. Um, we remove the so-called stop words. Stop words are very common words that appear in almost every sentence you have out there. So they add very little meaning in the search query because you would find every sentence out there. So we, or you can, you don't have to, but you can remove the stop words to remove that kind of background noise and just keep the relevant terms. Um, so you can see droids you looking. Those are the non-stop words that we have in this text here. And then, we could um, stem. So stemming is basically reducing a word down to the word root. So for example, from droids, we go to droid, from looking to look. So it's really trying to reduce something down to the word root. The word root is sometimes not a proper word anymore, but it's just like some base form that is being stemmed to. But it kind of like unifies concepts because you don't care about like the specific form like singular, plural, or how the verb is flected uh, right now. So you just try to reduce it down to the concept. English is a very simple language in that regard because you cut off the ing at the end or the s for the plural or the third person singular. Um, you just cut those off at the end and you only have a couple of rules and stemming works pretty well for that. Other languages, for example, Russian, um, works very differently or is much more complicated to stem. And Asian languages are, again, a different beast, and I'll try to avoid those for today. So this is what you generally do. So you run through this pipeline, and you prepare, or you can prepare this um, to actually only store what will make sense for your search later on. Um, so we can actually simulate that. Um, we have an analyze endpoint. So you can just run a query. You can see we have. Um, underscore analyze, this is not storing anything, this is just simulating what would happen if I would try to store this. So here I can just say like, I have an English sentence and the text I'm trying to analyze is this one here. And to actually um, do this a bit more live, so we have, this is Kibana, Kibana is just easier to interact with um, that query. So for example, for this query here, get slash, I could get the same curl command and the curl command uh, would be, it's a bit small. But the curl command would be this. So you would always need curl x, and then you have the HTTP verb, and then you would need the server and the port, and then you have the slash. And so the console command is just get and the variable part here. So you just provide the HTTP verb and like what you're really wanting to do. You can totally do the same thing with curl. It's just easier to have it here because I can skip the repetitive parts. So. What I can do is I can take my sentence, these are not the droids you're looking for, and I run this against the underscore analyze endpoint. So this simulates what would happen if you would store that. It's not storing anything, it's just simulating. So we can try this out. And you can see we have these tokens that I've shown you before, droid you look. And we have some additional uh, data around that. So we have alphanumeric, we'll later on see synonyms that would be an alternative for the type. We also see a start and an end offset. What could I use the start and the end offset for? Or why is it important to store that with your terms? Any guesses? Yeah? Uh, for yes, exactly, for highlighting. So what is what this will help you with, I mean, this sentence, these are not the droids you're looking for, is very short. So searching for the search term that you have found is simple. But if you have a very long text, it might add quite a bit of overhead to reparse the entire sentence and find where was this thing that I have found to highlight it. Whereas here now, I don't have to care anymore. I don't have to uh, analyze the source anymore. I just have these markers and I can set like sentence starts or my, my search term U starts here and ends here and I can just set the right markers. I'm keeping the position as well. Why do I, so first off, do we start counting at zero or one? Zero, like every proper system. Um, 
And we keep the position. Why do we keep the position? No, not relevancy? Phrases. Where, where this comes in is to make phrase search much more performant. So for example, if you search for the phrase droid U, which is not a great phrase, but let's assume we search for droid U, we could make sure that as text contains droid and U, and one has the position N and the other one N plus one. And that way you can very easily make sure that all your terms are there and one is followed exactly by the next one. And that will make phrase searches much more performant. So these things are all that we can extract and store and that will make your search afterwards much quicker. Um, you can kind of like configure this entire pipeline so you can say, hey, I want to have this HTML strip that I have here. Um, I use the standard tokenizer, I lowercase, I remove the stop words and I do the snowball stemming and you get the same result. But you can configure every one of these steps or you can skip them if it doesn't make sense for you. Or you can replace them with something else. For example, there are snowball stemmer is just one of many stemmers that you can use uh, for texts. So this is what you can do here. Um, sometimes people are confused, like how many stop words are there? The list of stop words in English is surprisingly short. Um, it is also very well hidden in Lucene. Um, so this is where you can find the list. And it also ha only has like 33 or 35, I always forget, um, words in it. It was just a coincidence that in our example, so many words were stop words that we have. Another thing that might be slightly confusing at first is that the stop words no and not are in there. Because you might assume no and not make a big difference. So it makes a difference, are there droids or are there no droids? But Elasticsearch or search in general doesn't really care about the content or the context. It's kind of stupid, but that also makes it very fast, is that it mostly works on just the tokens that you have extracted. It is not natural language processing. It doesn't understand your sentence. It doesn't know are there droids or are there no droids. It's just working on similar tokens that you have been searching for. So it doesn't understand that there are droids or there are no droids. This is natural language processing, but this is right now not part of what Elasticsearch itself is doing. Um, should you always use stop words? Any guesses? Yeah, intelligence is always relative. Um, I, I'm Yes, it, it depends very much. Um, normally, what people will say is it depends, and normally they are consultants and then will charge a lot of money. Um, but it's also a very nice business model. Yes, it really depends on what you're looking for, or maybe you need to search or analyze data multiple ways, because sometimes removal of stop words is the right thing because it's just background noise, and sometimes it removes important things. For example, if you have this phrase, these are all stop words. There is nothing remaining. If you use stop words, you will never be able to find that phrase again because everything is a stop word and everything is removed. Um, so you need to be a bit careful of what you're looking for and how it makes sense. Um, language support-wise, we do support a lot of languages, including uh, Basque and Catalan, um, and of course Spanish, uh, and lots of others. The ones I run frequently into that we don't support is, are Slovenian and Slovakian, but they're pretty small um, groups. Um, yeah. You can also add more plugins, for example, if you need better support for Asian languages, we have plugins for that. ICU, for example, can tokenize Asian languages very well and do some other nifty stuff around UTF-8 characters. Um, or, for example, Japanese is a complicated language, um, or, for example, Polish as well. So we don't bundle all these rules by default because A, it would make the downloads larger. And B, you might need to load things into memory that you don't really need for many use cases. So you can just add them as a plugin as needed. Um, language rules are, of course, language dependent. So for example, English, rule, English rules will not make much sense for other languages. But in English, for example, you have this apostrophe S for is, has, or the possessive. And you can just throw it out. In French, for example, you might have the article in the front. Um, and we stripped that out, and for example, the accent, in this example, the accent is gone. It doesn't always, it's not always removed, but in this example, it doesn't make a difference. Um, in German, we have these weird umlauts and that special S thing. In German, we don't assume they make much difference, so we just remove them and flatten stuff out. In other languages, for example, in Swedish, the A umlaut is a totally different letter, and there the A umlaut stays. But this is kind of like a problem that linguists define, and they say, like, this is what makes sense for 
this language and then you just implement the right rules. But linguists need to figure out what is the right thing to do. So, I think this is the right phrase in Spanish, or I hope, but I don't speak Spanish, so I, I, I will not try to pronounce that. Um, what do you think will remain when I run that through the Spanish analyzer? So what you can just do is you have your phrase here, um, your Spanish phrase, and I say this is the Spanish analyzer. Which tokens will remain uh, on that one? Any guesses? So what you get is... I, this means draw it. Does this mean something like look? Okay, and this is is, or... Okay. Um, yeah, so this is what um, the Spanish analyzer will give you for that one. Uh, by the way, what happens if I use a Spanish text with the English analyzer? Any guesses? Yeah, nothing good, because the rules just don't match up. For example, here the S is removed, because it just assumes, well, S at the end is a plural, or the third person singular, so you just cut that off. But it doesn't make any sense for Spanish. So you, Elasticsearch does not by default detect the language. You will need to know what is the language to use the right analyzer. We have plugins to detect that, and probably in the, or maybe in the future we will have features built in to do that language detection for you. But right now, you will need to know what is the language that I have here to use the right language analyzer on top of that. Otherwise, it will not work. Um, Let's look at other examples. So let's say I have Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. How many tokens will we get? Or what will we get out of that? Or let's start simpler. Obi-Wan, how many tokens will that be? Any guesses? Yeah, it depends on which part was breaking up things. The tokenizer was breaking up. So it depends on the tokenizer. The standard tokenizer will break this up into two tokens. There is another tokenizer, which is white space, that would only break up on white spaces. That one would keep it in one. So you will need to find the right tokenizer for your example. So what you get out of this here is Obi-Wan never told you what happened your father. So only the two here is a stop word. Nothing else. But it just happens that some are stop words and some are not stop words. Um, so this is what you get out of this. No, I am your father. What remains out of that? Father. Yeah, father is true, but that's not the only thing. No. Yeah, so... Oh, sorry. This one, I want to run this one. Um, I am your father. Only the no is a stop word here. Which might be slightly confusing because the no might make a difference here, but it's the only thing that is defined as a stop word. You could, by the way, overwrite the list of stop words and define your own if you think you know better, or for your use case, a different list of stop words makes more sense. Okay, so we have seen that. Um, what is important now and what is making search very fast afterwards is that we create a so-called inverted index out of these extracted tokens. So what we do basically is these are all the tokens that we have extracted. And we sort them alphabetically, and then we have a linked list of where does this token appear in which document. So this was the, um, these are not the droids you're looking for. Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. And no, I am your father. And you can see this is how many times does the token appear, and this is the position where the token appears in the sentence. And with that information, you just store that, and that will make the search very fast afterwards. Because when you search for a specific token, you basically know in the list that is alphabetically sorted, okay, I search for look, and then you see, okay, where does look appear? And look only appears in the first document, and you have like a direct point to do that. You never need to analyze the text, you just have like a pointer to the right place, and then you can search it. If you have an end or an or search, you can just end or or connect these lines then with the right tokens. So that will make your search just very fast and you don't need to look into or grab through any text anymore. Um, you also don't have the problem of the like search with a percentage, for example, in the beginning, where you cannot use an index, like a B3 index in the relational world, because any wildcard in the beginning, well, throws off any index. Here you have just extracted the right stuff, and then your search will be very fast because of that. Um, okay, now let's actually store something. Um, 
Sometimes, so the thing where we store this, we call that D index, and to store it, we call it to index because it's not just storing, it's just this ins entire um, indexing part with the, the pipeline that we run through. So here I create a so-called index Star Wars. So we just put everything into Star Wars, which will contain related documents around Star Wars. Now I define some synonyms. So here I say I have synonyms and I have father and dad. They are exactly the same thing and I replace droid with droid and machine. What does that mean? Why do I replace droid with droid and machine? Why don't I just make a comma and say these are the same thing? Yes, exactly. So basically every droid is a machine, but not every machine is a droid, because could could be, I don't know, a household machine or whatever other machines. But a droid, I would say, is a machine in the broadest sense. So you can have like different like, kinds of replacements or synonyms here. So father and dad are just exactly the same thing in concept. Um, droid and machine are not, so we replace one with the other here. Um, I put this into my synonym filter. Then I define my analysis pipeline that you've seen before. And at the very end, the last step that I run is I replace the synonyms here. So after removing the stop words and after stemming, I look at what are, is in my synonym list and I will add or replace those synonyms in my list. I put that analysis pipeline into my analyzer and then I have, this here is pretty much like a schema in the relational world. Um, I have a field called quote, which is of the type text and uses my analyzer. So this will create the index Star Wars with this analysis pipeline and then has a single field quote which is text and uses that analysis pipeline. So when I run that, it creates my index and then I can insert the three documents that we've seen before. So I just insert those three. It will tell me, okay, I have created that document in Star Wars index with that ID and it all worked out here. Um, you can then retrieve one specific document. For example, here you can see this is the metadata around it. So you can see this is in the Star Wars index. This is a document with the ID one. This is the first time you've written this. Every time you update this, this would increment, etc. And then you have the source, and this is the original document that you have stored. You can also just retrieve the source with underscore source here. This is pretty much what you get from a relational database, where you do a select, I don't know, where ID one, or select from Star Wars where ID 1, and then you just get this back. But this is not really the, the thing that you want to have um, in search. Retrieving by ID is possible and fast, but it's not really the power of full text search. Um, let's do some other more interesting queries. If I run this Star Wars search query match all, what would be the SQL equivalent of this query? Yeah, select star from Star Wars, basically. So we have a query, and then we just do a match all and if I highlight the right one, it would give me my three documents back. And you basically see I have hits, um, which tells me I have three hits, and then you get the documents and the relevant metadata around them back. If I search for this one here, so here I have a query, I do a match, not a match all, but a match, so I search for something specific. On the field quote, I search for a droid. Will this find anything? Yes, but I have stored in my inverted index, I have droid in lowercase, and here I'm searching for uppercase. Will you still find something? Yes, why? Yes, exactly. That's a very important point. What we do is, um, when we store something, we use this analysis pipeline. And then when we search for something, it runs through the same analysis pipeline. So it will be lowercase, we will remove the stop words, we will do the stemming. The nice thing is that after that, you can just do exact matches because since it has been stemmed down, if you search for looks or looking, it doesn't matter, it will be stemmed down to look and then you can just search for direct hits on look which will make your search much more performant. However, what does that mean for updating the analysis pipeline? It's not possible. Because then, the way you would have stored something, and then when you query something, those would not match anymore and you wouldn't find anything. That's why in Elasticsearch, or in Lucene also in general, you can always add fields, 
but you cannot change existing fields really, or especially not analysis pipelines. You cannot change them because then what you have stored and what you will be searching for in the future, they will not match up. So you need to be a bit careful there. And like that mapping evolution, um, like you need to have a good strategy around how to move forward and change mappings. So if I search for Droid, this will still find Droid. Um, if I search for Droids in the plural, will I find something? Yeah. Yes. Um, because it does the same thing. If I run the same query and I search for dead, will I find anything? Because here the synonyms are at work. So here um, I have no, I am your father, and Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. And the score of this one is zero point, we'll get into the score in a few moments, is 0 0.72. This is basically how relevant is that document for this search query. Do you think it will be the same value if I search for father directly? Yes, because the moment, at the moment how this is implemented is that when you search for synonyms, they're really just the same thing. So it's really just a replacement. Um, and it doesn't make any difference for the, for the query here. Um, okay, we have done all of these. Um, I don't want to run this. Um, let's do a phrase search. I am your father. Will this find anything? So here, instead of a, of a match, we have a match phrase. Will this find anything? Yes, because here we have all the tokens. So what this basically does is it makes sure that in your search query, all the terms from your search query, I am your father, need to be in the document. And they must all have exactly the same order. So if I remove that one, I am father, will that find anything? No, because then the order is wrong, um, and we have not n, n plus 1, n plus 2, but n plus 3, and we're missing one here, so that's why we don't find anything. Um, but you can add a so-called slop factor. Um, let's try this one here. With the slop factor, um, you could have one offset, or you could have like the counting between your search term and your document can be off by one here. All the terms that you have in your search query still need to be there. So if I run this, will, you f will we find anything? Yes. So it's here you see, I am your father. Um, will you find anything with I am not your father? Yes, no, maybe. So we find something. But why are we finding something? I said, everything that we have in our search query needs to be in our document. Why are we still finding something? Yeah, not is a stop word. So basically, the not is then being removed. I'm searching for I am your father, and the slop is needed because then in my search term, like here you have another kind of like offset or like count in the positions which is one wrong. Um, what would not work, for example, is if you say like, I am your loving father, this will obviously not find anything because there is no loving in that phrase. So you need to know how stop words, what are the stop words and how are they being applied um, to make sense out of that. Um, we also have a nice concept called fuzziness. Fuzziness is basically, I don't know how to spell Obi-Wan anymore and I misspelled Obi-Wan, so I spell it Wan. And then you can say, yes, this is fuzzy and when you run that query, it will still, the score or relevancy will be lower because we needed to use that fuzziness, um, but you will be able to find that. Um, fuzziness auto basically sets a fuzziness based on how long that one is. Fuzziness is basically a Levenstein distance. Those who forgot what uh, the Levenstein distance was, Levenstein distance are basically edits. So between what you're searching for and the result that you're finding. And Levenstein distance of one is one letter could be different, missing, or too much. Whereas if you have two, it could be any combination of one or two letters being too much, missing, or different. Um, and if you have auto, the auto will basically define, um, if your search term it has up to two characters, auto fuzziness would be zero. If you have three to five characters, fuzziness would be one. And if you have more than five characters, the fuzziness would be two. And you cannot set a higher value to fuzziness than two anymore, because then you would just find a lot of 
very different things and it would just create too much noise. So we kind of stopped how much uh, fuzziness you can find. Uh, so this just finds the right thing. Now, let's assume I have OV1 and I have misspelled both and I search with the fuzziness of one. Will I find anything or will I not find anything? Everybody for yes? So yes, we will find something because this will be, in the standard tokenizer, this will be two tokens and the fuzziness is on a per token level. Um, but this is something you just need to know. So you need to know like, how is your text broken up and how is the fuzziness being applied. And then you will find this. Um, by the way, initially we had like, a very bad approach for doing fuzziness in Lucene. Um, it was basically a brute force approach. Now we have a much smarter approach, which is a Levenstein automaton, which basically looks like this. Um, so let's assume we're searching for food. So we have food, F-O-O-D. So going horizontally, this is an exact match. And going up is one of your edits. So here we are searching with two edits. And we're basically trying to find a path through that graph from the bottom left corner to the top, top right uh, node. Um, so you need to find some way through that system with the existing terms that you have. And that is how the fuzziness is being applied. And the funny thing was, initially, um, there was a paper on that, and nobody really understood the paper. And then somebody had written an implementation in Python that also nobody really understood. But then they just ported the Python code one-to-one -to, -one to Java, and then it worked. Um, but the blog post from uh, Mike here, um, that actually describes how they struggled with the algorithm and how they managed to put it together in the end. Um, or you could do this in a relational database, but this is not going to be much fun, especially if you have longer terms. Um, and if you have wildcards in the beginning, it's also not going to be very fast. So you probably don't want to do that. So next up, scoring. We have seen that score. The score was this quality attribute. How well does this search term or search query match any document? And how do we calculate this? So the base idea behind this is called TFIDF, term frequency, inverse document frequency. Um, if you search for one term. By now, we have updated or tweaked that algorithm a bit, and it's now called BM25. That is the one we use by default now, and this stands for Best Match 25. This is the 25th iteration of the Best Match algorithm. Um, so maybe in the future, we will have a BM30 or whatever. Um, it's like slightly tuned parameters, but otherwise, it's working very similar. And it has three main components, uh, this BM25 or TFIDF. So the first thing is the term frequency. The assumption is if you're searching for father and one document contains father once and then another document contains father three times, the document that contains father three times is more relevant. Or, yeah, you just take the square root of the frequency, which looks something like this. So here we assume this is how many times does my term appear so father, how many appearances of father do we have, and how relevant is the document. So you can see if it just appears once, it's like, Mildly relevant. If it's five times, it's more relevant. The main difference then is that we see that with BM25, we assume that once you have hit five occurrences, the relevancy doesn't really change anymore. Whereas TFIDF just keeps growing. This assumes that 20 occurrences is much more important than five. Whereas BM25 assumes, well, it doesn't change much anymore. So it's just tweaked curves, basically. Next up, the inverse document frequency. The inverse document frequency the base assumption is, over all the documents that I have, how common is a term? And basically the idea is, if a term is very rare, then it's very important. Whereas, if it's a very common term, then we dampen the relevancy. And it looks something like this. So this is not just in one document, but over all the documents, or actually that specific field on which we're searching. Um, how many times does one specific term appear? and how relevant is it. So you can see if it appears a hundred times, it's pretty relevant still. Whereas if it appears a thousand times, it's not really that relevant anymore. So the assumption is if something is rare, it should be valuable. If something is very common, it's not valuable. So the uh, relevancy will be kind of like dampened down. And then the field length norm is kind of intuitive. The field length norm assumes if you have a very short field and your search term appears in the short field, it's more relevant than if it's in a very long field. For example, if you have the title and the fi title has five tokens and father appears there, this is probably a pretty good hit. Whereas if you have a very long text body with a 
a thousand tokens, and father appears once in a thousand tokens, it's not really as relevant as if it's in the short title. So that's the main takeaway. Um, and you can actually debug all of that when you add explain true to a query, and then you just see how it's being calculated. It will give you quite a lot of output, but you can see all the parts that we have discussed. So you have a score where it says, okay, the score is 0 0.419, whatever. And you see the inverse document frequency is this, and the query norm is this, and the term frequency is this. So it shows you what are all the independent pieces and how can they be combined and why did I get this specific score for a document. Um, so I searched for father, why is the first document more relevant than the second one? Yes, it's just the length. Because the term frequency is the same. Both contain father ones. The inverse document frequency is also the same because it's father on both of them, and it's just one. Um, the first one just has four tokens, and the other one, I think, has nine or so. Um, so the second one is longer, and you can see the relevancy is a bit lower, but not that much. It's only 0 0.02 or so that the relevancy is actually lower. But it's less relevant, so this is how we calculate this. Now, all of this was kind of the simple approach if you search for a single term. Uh, what happens if you search for multiple terms? And the question is, if you have all the terms matching, yeah, those are good matches. But what happens if only one of the terms is matching that you search for? Which one is more relevant? And for that, there is a fancy thing called the vector space model. And we assume we are searching for your and father. And we assume that your is very common, so the relevancy is not that high, so it's only one. Whereas father is pretty uncommon in Star Wars, so it's much more relevant, so the relevancy is five. The perfect document would contain both your and father, so it would be this vector here that contains your and father. And then the question is, which documents are more relevant? The ones just containing your or just father? And for that, we draw out their vectors, and then you can calculate the angle, and the smaller the angle, the more relevant the document is. So the perfect document would contain your and father. The next group of documents basically would be the ones just containing father. And the last one would be the ones just containing your, because this has a much greater angle, so it's further away from the rest. And if you search for two terms, this is a two-dimensional problem. If you have three terms, it's three-dimensional, etc. But those are a bit harder to draw out, so we'll stick to two dimensionals for today. Um, and we also have a so-called coordination factor, and it basically rewards multiple terms. If multiple terms appear, we will reward that. So not only do we add up the scores of each individual term, for example, if we search for three, if only one is there, we multiply it by one third. Whereas if we have three terms and all three are there, then we multiply it with three thirds. So basically, we reward documents that have more matching terms in them than just single ones and not just taking individual scores. Um, and then you can put all of that together, and it's called the practical scoring function. I'm never sure how practical it actually is, um, but this is what it looks like. And we've kind of discussed all of those things. So you have the query norm, the coordination factor, the term frequency, the inverse document frequency, uh, the query length norm. You can boost specific terms or fields, um, but that's just a runtime feature that gets mixed in there put all of that together, and that is how the score is being calculated that you get out. And that is this number that you get out of that. Um, you could have a function score where you influence or calculate your own score, um, where you could provide a script to calculate something. For example, if you have products and somebody liked or rated product, you could include in the relevancy the how many likes or scores or whatever people gave to that product. Or you could, for example, have something that uses geo or date decaying. So for example, if you want to order a pizza tonight, you have your geo location, and you basically decay out, like the further something is away, the less relevant it is. You decay out, like radioactive decay, stuff that is further away is less relevant. Or for example, if you have a newspaper website, um, probably the more recent things are more relevant than the things that are very long ago, and then you can decay those out as well. Um, one thing that you could do is you could use a function score here, and I'm just using a random score. And if I search for father, um, I will have two documents coming back for father, but their score will be random, and their order will also be random. Where might this be useful, by the way? Like random functions or uh, random scores don't sound overly um, helpful in general. So here we can just search for that and. Um, 
I have a size one. So this is basically a limit one. We don't really need that. Um, we can say I want both documents. You can see, depending on what you run, the, the scores always change and whoever or which document is first also changes. Where might this be relevant? If you have a very large text body and you want to have a sample set of the data, it might be interesting to just grab some random documents out of these to look at them. Or if you have this one here, sometimes um, we sponsor at conferences and then we have a prize to give away, and this is how we draw the winner of the prize. So it's basically the random function of like, okay, this person now wins the Star Wars Lego thing that we have or whatever. Um, so you can do that. Um, Final thing, a lot of people, or oftentimes people try to say like, I want to translate this score into percentages. Um, so to say like, this is a 100% perfect match or this is a 50% match. I want to have like, how, how well does this match? I want to have this in percentages. This doesn't work. Um, there is a dedicated page, scores as percentages, which is pretty explicit that you should not do that because it just doesn't work. Um, so don't try to do this because it will fail. And I can quickly show you why. Um, so let's say these are my father's machines. We'll anal analyze that, and you can see my father, dad, machine. So here you can see the, the synonym is at work, dad and father. But we have my father, machine. These are the tokens that remain from that search phrase here. So let's assume we add, add a fourth document. These are my father's machines. And then we search for my father machine. And you could assume this is like a 100% match because all the three search terms that I have in my search query are in my result or in, are in one document. So we could say that one that comes back, these are my father's machines, has 2.9 score, and the next one has 0 0.8, whatever. So we could say that the 0 0.9 score, that is a 100% match, right? Everybody more or less agrees, right? The problem is, what happens if I delete the document and run the query again. Then my scores change, and now that one will change because it always depends on, because of the inverse document frequency, it depends on how common is the term. Now everything changed, now this has 1.2 score. Um, is this now a 43% match, or is this the new 100% match? And it gets even worse um, if we add another document now and say, these droids are my father's father's machines, and you can see we have father twice, and with the synonym we have droid, machine, we have machine twice as well. If we search for that, what will happen? The score will be even higher. And so basically, um, then you have a score of three, and then you have a 103% match. So the score is always only relevant within one query. Don't try to translate it to percentages. Also, don't compare scores between queries, because every time you add a document or you delete the document or you change anything slightly in the query, your scores will totally be different. The score is only relevant within one query, and it's only supposed to be like that. It does not help to compare scores across queries. Um, so don't try to do that because it just doesn't work out well. Um, final thing, performance. People often ask, like, show us some numbers why this is much more performant than any other system. And unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. This is my favorite comic for these performance comparisons. This happens every time some vendor does a benchmark against their competition. Um, and you see, under similar conditions, we killed the house cat and then concluded that the squid was much more intelligent than the house cat. Um, and this is what most vendor benchmarks will give you. Um, they're pretty useless. Um, you will need to do your own benchmarks for your scenario and your data and your read-write ratio and your kind of query and load and everything and your hardware. Any other benchmarks are probably not so meaningful for your specific use case. Um, and then the final thing is, does anybody remember Dr. Evil when he came back from the 60s and he wanted some ransom money and asked for $1 million because in the 60s it was a lot of money? The same thing is what we have when people say, like, we have a lot of documents and we ask, like, how, ma how much is a lot of documents? And they're like, it's a million. And we're like, yeah, a million, that's, that's a nice use case. That's, don't worry, it will just work. Um, so for search, oftentimes, the scale is not really the issue. Because Wikipedia is running on Elasticsearch, for example, and that's a pretty big use case, and they handle fine with, I don't know, 25 or 30 or whatever nodes. And that just works uh, without many problems. So yeah, a million documents, for example, is not an issue. So to wrap up, we've used or looked at indexing, that we do more work upfront. 
that search is more performant and feature-rich afterwards. We, if you looked into scoring and how we put together like the relevancy of how relevant some documents are. Um, oh, and by the way, if you don't want to dive into the details, we also have kind of a solution on top of everything, um, where you basically have something like this, where you want to have a UI like that, and you have just fields, and you just say like, okay, I know this is a full-text search field, and I know this is a price, and I, these are opening times, and I want to filter on those. And where you can basically click something like that together um, on top of that. So while you can build all of that, and this is just built on Elasticsearch, um, if you don't want to go into the details of the mappings and define your synonyms and everything, um, we have a solution which will give you a UI where you can define synonyms in a UI list, or you can boost specific fields, or where you can pin specific results. For example, this one would be pinned because somebody wanted that to be promoted or whatever. So you can just build it yourself, but if you don't want to, um, we also have solutions kind of on top to make your life a bit easier. That's it from me. Um, I have a couple of stickers, or actually a lot of stickers over there. If anybody wants to grab stickers, grab stickers. Any questions? Yes, shout. Well, you're, you're matching multiple things together. Um, you mean the practical scoring function? Um, dum, 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 dum. This one here. Right? Um, no, I think this is the right formula for the practical scoring function. But it's like a sum of the term in each query, and then you need to multiply it out and everything. Um, but to be honest, I've never calculated that by hand, because it's kind of tedious, and Elasticsearch will just do it for you. Um, but yeah, if you look for the practical scoring function as the search term you want to have, and I think this is the right formula for that. Any other questions? No? Cool. Yeah, sure. Um, so we provide it as a service for now, but we, I think it's still in beta that you can you run it yourself as well. Um, so it's called App Search. Basically, it has an API. You throw your documents in, and then you just say, like, this is a full text search field, or this is a filter field for price range or whatever. Um, and then you just have a search field, and it does the right thing in the background for you. If you have a specific use case and you want to build something that works perfectly for your use case, probably you still want to build it yourself. But it's like this 80% solution. Like, you don't want to know all the details and how all the queries work, uh, but it's just something where you specify a bit, like with 20% of the effort you get 80% of the solution. That's the general idea, so we want to have a bit more of a solution around it because some people like writing queries, others don't so much, they just want a working solution, so you can pick. Um, sure, final question, I guess we're running out of time. So, I mean, we have Logstash as a product, and the thing you want is um, elastic.co. That's actually a good coincidence, because just yesterday, one of my colleagues wrote a blog post about that, depending on how fast the Wi-Fi is. There will be the very, it should be the very first thing um, here, how to keep Elasticsearch synchronized. Um, so, Logstash, in basic, Basically, what you will have is Logstash can run. I can barely read it, but I guess we are out of time. <laughs> okay. Um, so, what basically Logstash does is it has a timer like cron job. You can run it every five seconds. It will run an SQL query with JDBC against that. Um, fetch data. Um, where is it? So where is my query? Somewhere here. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the configuration you want to have in Logstash. So basically, you connect to your database. Um, you connect, then you have, for example, it runs every five seconds, and you can specify you have a change timestamp. 
So the relational database ne always needs to have a timestamp when something changed, and then you can just fetch whatever data um, was changed since then, and then you replicate that over. And that's how you can synchronize something. The tricky part is how do you handle deletes? Because if you just delete a row, there is no update to be replicated. So what you would need to do is you would need to have a Boolean flag where you said delete it, and then you basically change the timestamp, and then in Logstash you could say delete that thing, and afterwards have a trigger in the relational database to clean up everything with that Boolean flag. That's a bit trickier to replicate the, the deletes. But inserts and updates are pretty easy to replicate. Cool. If you have more questions, just find me afterwards. Um, I'll be around. Thanks a lot. <laughs>